Hello, welcome to the EMED lecture series. I am Laura Bontempo, an assistant professor at the University of Maryland in the Department of Emergency Medicine. And today we're going to be speaking about hyperkalemia. Why are we talking about hyperkalemia in the first place? Well, it is the most important and the most dangerous electrolyte emergency you're going to deal with in the emergency department. Hyperkalemia, bread and butter emergency medicine. You're going to see tons of patients with it. If your population is anything like my patient population, we see a lot of hyperkalemia, both mild and quite dramatic presentations. You need to know how to deal with it. It's all taken care of in the emergency department. Something you need to know. All right. We're going to break this down into who, when, and how. Who to treat when to treat, and how to go ahead and treat that patient population. First of all, I'm going to start with the who. Okay. Those at risk. Well, obviously the patients with CKD come to mind. The chronic kidney disease patients are the ones that you probably think of right away when you talk about patients with hyperkalemia. And that is true. Okay, stage 3 or greater chronic kidney disease patients certainly are at risk for hyperkalemia, but they are not the only patients at risk for hyperkalemia. You have to think about patients on different medications and with other medical issues as well. Potassium supplementation. Patients take potassium supplements, and even patients with totally normal, healthy kidneys can overwhelm the ability of the kidney to filter out that potassium. Okay? It just overwhelms the mechanism in the kidneys. You know, you're making urine, kidney function's fine, creatinine's fine, but you're taking too much potassium in, potassium starts to build up in the extracellular space, potassium levels go up. Uh, patients on RAS inhibitors, the renin, aldosterone, angiotensin system inhibitors, these are very common blood pressure medications. You talk about the ACE inhibitors, you talk about the ARBs, you talk about potassium sparing diuretics. Patients who are on these that also have underlying CKD are at risk for hyperkalemia. Okay, so it's a combination, and combinations of meds cause these problems as well. Now, there's a list of other things, some very common like NSAIDs, and some sort of less common like heparin that can also cause hyperkalemia. So, of course, we think about CKD, but think beyond CKD. Widen that horizon a little bit, especially of patients with some, maybe some underlying or maybe even some undiagnosed kidney disease that are on. Uh, antihypertensive medicines or even just taking over-the-counter meds. All right. Um, now, of course, you have the non-compliant hemodialysis patient. Those are the patients that we really worry about with hyperkalemia. You know, I take care of a lot of patients on hemodialysis. That's the patient population that I serve. I imagine everyone listening to this takes care of patients on hemodialysis. And some patients just simply skip dialysis. They're busy or they don't want to go. But there are also other reasons why patients don't go to dialysis, and they just don't realize how dangerous it is. They don't go because they weren't feeling well. There was something else going on, so they didn't make it to their dialysis. They felt too sick or too weak to go. See a lot of hyperkalemia following adverse weather events. So a big snowstorm, per se, and patients cannot get to dialysis. It's not that they're choosing not to go, it's that they don't have the ability to get there. They might have gone over their, their long weekend, you know, their three-day break from dialysis, and then they mix their, miss their next one. All of a sudden, you're five days from your last dialysis, and you're looking at a hyperkalemic state. Difficult situation for that patient and something that you have to know how to react to. All right. So that's true hyperkalemia. But there's also things that can fool you. We don't want you to be fooled. So pseudo-hyperkalemia. Now, you might think, well, what causes pseudo-hyperkalemia? It's the lab. It's lab error. It's always lab error. It's actually not lab error most of the time. It is error, but not lab error. Okay. So what causes pseudo-hyperkalemia? Well, a lot of things can cause pseudo-hyperkalemia. Phlebotomy techniques are one, and I'm not talking about small needles. When you contract your muscles, potassium shifts from the muscles to the extracellular space. So if someone puts a tourniquet on your arm because they're going to draw blood and they ask you to pump your wrist a few times to get those veins nice and plumped up to make the blood draw easy, and your patient's great and compliant and they're pumping their wrist and pumping their wrist and pumping their wrist and the tourniquet's on, containing that blood to the distal part of the arm, and then the blood gets drawn, you will get a true lab value of hyperkalemia. It's not a lab error. It really is hyperkalemia, but it's a transient hyperkalemia. It's a hyperkalemia normal physiologic caused by release of potassium from the muscle cells into the extracellular space, a true reading, but not a danger to the patient. Okay. Then we talk about hemolysis. Well, sure. You use a small needle, you draw in fluid, you draw in your cells, you hemolysize some of the cells, and you get potassium release. It's a true reading from the lab, and it's hyperkalemia, but it's not hyperkalemia that in any way is dangerous to your patient. It's a matter of shearing of red blood cells. Okay. Thrombocytosis. Well, I don't generally think of thrombocytosis as causing hyperkalemia, but if your platelet count is greater than 500,000, 
you can actually get a hyperkalemia reading, which is not a true systemic hyperkalemia. Platelets are fragile. They're fragile things. And during clotting, platelets can release potassium. So if your potassium level is high and your platelet level is greater than 500,000, take that in clinical context and decide if you think that that's real or not. Does your patient have a reason to be hyperkalemic? And if you don't think it's real, you can ask for a whole blood potassium. Okay, it has to be specially ordered at the lab. Again, just send it down again. Don't do it again. That's not going to help anything. But a whole blood potassium will let you know if that hyperkalemia is real or not. Same thing goes with leukocytosis, especially patients uh, with leukemia, uh, leukemic lymphocytosis. Those white blood cells are pretty fragile, and when those cells lyse, well, potassium gets released. So if you have a patient with an elevated white blood cell count, uh, and you have a hyperkalemia, and you're not quite sure it fits the clinical picture, well, it might not. It might be a true reading from the lab, not a lab error, but not a systemic hyperkalemia. So again, a whole blood potassium level is the way to go to see if you can get a more accurate reading. And with a leukocytosis, getting a whole blood potassium off of a blood sample drawn into a blood gas syringe is even going to benefit you more because there's less heparin in that blood gas syringe, and it might give you a more accurate reading. Something to think about. Okay. And then exercise. Well, we said that exercise, when you contract your muscles, potassium is released from your muscles into the extracellular space. So you might think, well, okay, who is exercising in my emergency department? You know, wait times are not all that long, but you know, even if you're running around the emergency department, you run right into the emergency department, am I going to draw your blood so close after you exercised that I'm going to get hyper, I'm going to get a hyperkalemic reading? And the answer is no. You're not. But think about who does exercise in your emergency department. Think about your seizure patients, right? The seizure patient comes in. They are exercising. They're doing full body exercise right there in the emergency department. And probably even while they're doing it, they're having their blood drawn. Or if not while, immediately thereafter they're having their blood drawn. And you can get a true reading from the lab of hyperkalemia that is a transient phenomenon in the patient. That potassium will shift back intracellularly uh, and does not need to be treated. So... Think about the things that cause true hyperkalemia. Think about the things that cause pseudo-hyperkalemia, not lab error, but either drawing error or transportation error or a uh, patient had a seizure and the labs were drawn immediately thereafter. All these things that can drive the potassium up where it does not necessarily really need to be treated. Okay, so that is pseudo-hyperkalemia. However, when I get an elevated potassium back, I'm not thinking pseudo-hyperkalemia. I'm thinking hyperkalemia, and I want to know if it's real or not. It's okay to be wrong and assume it's real and then to have a minute to think and back yourself down and decide that it's not. But if I have hyperkalemia, like as I'm hanging up the phone with the lab, hearing about this high potassium level, I'm waving someone down asking for what? I'm asking for, of course, an EKG. That is what I consider to be a no-brainer. Okay, You get elevated potassium, you want that EKG. That is your next go-to move. Elevated K. EKG, they should go together. If it's pseudo-hyperkalemia, okay, your patient might have gotten an EKG they don't need. There are far worse things than that to do to a patient. Elevated potassium, EKG. All right. So now I've got my potassium level and I've got my EKG. Should I be worried? Well, we're going to correlate these two and decide when we, do, when we really do need to worry. Hyperkalemia, we're going to break it down to mild, moderate, and severe hyperkalemia. These are not hard and fast definitions. These are generally the ranges where you worry a little bit, worry more, and then worry a whole lot. Mild hyperkalemia, five and a half to six and a half. Moderate hyperkalemia, six and a half to eight. Anything greater than eight, I'm really worried. That's severe hyperkalemia. Now let's look what happens on the EKG. Okay. So mild hyperkalemia, you get those tall, pointed, peak T waves. You touch the end of that with your finger, you're going to prick yourself, it's going to hurt. I was always taught you don't want to sit on hyperkalemic T waves, so it's going to be uncomfortable for you. Really tall, pointed T waves. Okay. Moderate hyperkalemia, six and a half to eight. Well, let's take a look at this. So you still have those T waves. They're, they're still pretty up there. They're still pretty pointy looking. Uh, not quite as dramatic as up there, but still pretty pointy looking. But what is missing here? There's something, something supposed to be there, right? Like a P wave supposed to be there? There's no P wave there. So what happens is obviously a gradation between the hyperkalemic T waves and the loss of your P wave, but that PR interval starts to lengthen, the amplitude of the P wave starts to go down, and then the P wave disappears. It becomes flat. And if you notice, there might even be a little bit uh, of widening of the QRS at this point. Again, there's no absolute. You don't jump from one to the next. It's a pathway from one to the next. All right. So now my P waves are gone. Now I'm getting a little nervous. 
Potassium greater than 8, well, what do we see there? You see the wide QRS. A okay, wide QRS, is, you can see that there's discernible electrical activity, certainly. There are individual beats that are quite evident, but that's wide. That's not a normal conduction uh, within the heart. Okay, potassium keeps going up. Then you kind of lose those individual beats, and you get more of this sine wave pattern, that rise and fall, rise and fall sine wave pattern. Uh, and if you keep going, if the potassium keeps going up and you don't uh, intervene, well, you get less of a sine wave and more of a flat wave pattern, right? You get asystole because the heart's not going to be able to con keep contracting in that hyperkalemic environment. Okay, worry a little, worry a little bit more, worry a lot, worry a whole lot when you get down to this end of things, okay? All right. Next, treatment. So you've got your level, you've got your EKG, it's real. It's not pseudo-hyperkalemia. EKG has changes. Potassium level's high. You have to know what to do. And when I see that, there's one thing I want more than anything else. There's one thing I want, and that's what I want. What I want is I want to see a big K drop, please. That's what I want. I want to see a big K drop, please. And this is our treatment algorithm. We're going to go through each of these. We'll talk about uh, the benefits and indication for each. And, and so what do these things stand for? C is calcium. A is albuterol, B, bicarb, then insulin and glucose, those two go together, K, exhalate, diuretics and dialysis, two for the D, diuretics and dialysis, uh, then pateromer, which is a new agent, and the new, not even yet properly named, ZS9, and we will talk about those as well. Okay, so let's take this one at a time. We're going to start from the top, and you can follow our progress along the side over here. C is for calcium. What does calcium do? Calcium antagonizes the effects of hyperkalemia on the myocardium, okay? So you probably not have looked at a picture of the myo, uh, myocardium contraction uh, cycle for a long time. A little throwback to medical school there, but I'm just going to put that up just to remind you what, you what you once learned and what you once knew. So potassium makes this cell excitable, right? Makes the heart cells excitable, and calcium antagonizes that effect. What does calcium do to potassium? Nothing. Calcium does nothing to the potassium. It doesn't shift it. It doesn't move it. It doesn't eliminate it. It does nothing. It's simply to stabilize the membranes of the muscle cells in the heart to try and prevent malignant dysrhythmias from happening. Okay. All right. Indication for giving calcium, wide QRS. Okay. If you start to see conduction delays within the heart, as evidenced by a wide QRS on your EKJ or your rhythm strip, that's when you go ahead and give calcium. Very important, okay? Calcium, when your QRS is narrow, calcium, when there's not evidence of conduction delay, even without elevated potassium number, not necessarily effective, right? Because, again, but calcium doesn't do anything for the potassium itself. All right. So continuing on with calcium, calcium comes in two flavors, right? Calcium chloride and calcium gluconate. Calcium chloride, uncomfortable to give. It's very sclerosing. It's painful when you give it, and it can take out your IV. It can sclerose the vein uh, and have your IV not be functional anymore. It can be given peripherally if it needs to be. If you're in a true emergent situation, life-threatening situation, you can give calcium chloride through a peripheral vein. Optimally, you want to give it through a large bore peripheral vein, but you have to give it, you give it. Uh, really optimally, if you want to give it through a central line, that's not often an option in your acutely hyperkalemic, potentially crashing patient. So it can be given peripherally uncomfortable. You can give one amp, which is 10 cc's. The other flavor is calcium gluconate. Well, it's glucose. It's sweeter. It's nicer to give. Okay, there's calcium gluconate. Um, you can give it. It's less sclerose, sclerosing. You give it if you need to give it, but not in an emergency situation. If you have a little bit of time, uh, you can give it as a slow infusion. This is the one you're going to use in kids. If you have a hyperkalemic child, uh, this is going to be your go-to uh, calcium gluconate, preferred over calcium chloride. Again, calcium chloride can be used, but you want to go with calcium gluconate if you can. And you can give 10 to 30 cc's. So these are each 10 cc vials, right? Why am I giving 10 cc's here and 10 to 30 cc's here? Well, calcium chloride is pretty potent stuff. Let's look at these bottles, okay? Look at the amount of elemental calcium in your calcium chloride versus the amount of elemental calcium in your calcium gluconate. Calcium chloride is three to four times the amount of elemental calcium per milliliter, okay? So one of these packs the same punch as about three of these. Okay. So just know there's a difference. It's not a one-to-one. -one. It's about three to four times uh, amount of calcium given in calcium chloride versus calcium gluconate. Okay. All right. That is calcium.
Onset is fast. It's one to three minutes, and I'll buy you about a half an hour to an hour of duration of action, uh, helping your heart out for about half an hour to an hour. So not long-term, temporizing, uh, but can be redosed if necessary. Okay. A, moving on to albuterol. Albuterol is beta agonist, right? It's a beta agonist we most commonly have in the emergency department. Salbuterol, if you have salbuterol, that works too. Any beta agonist is fine. You could even use epi uh, if necessary as a beta agonist. And let's talk about why we're using beta agonist. Um, by the way, between epi and albuterol, I prefer to use albuterol. It's, it's a lot easier on your patient. Okay. It simulates the sodium potassium pump. Okay. Again, something you might not have looked at in a long time, but remember the sodium-potassium pump, sodium goes out, potassium comes into the cell. That's what you want. You want more potassium in the cell than outside of the cell. You need to get that pump revved up, and that's what beta agonists do. Okay. Um, what you want to do is you want to give your patient a neb, but just not a regular asthma neb. Put 10 to 20 milligrams of albuterol in a mask. Put the mask on the patient. Main benefit here, huge benefit here, don't need an IV. You don't need an IV for it. Renal patients can be really challenging. Anyone who's taking care of a kidney patient knows that those veins can be really tough to cannulate. So you can just put this on your patient while other things are going on, put that neb on, get them to breathe it in while you're looking for veins, while you're starting your other treatments, just get them breathing this. It's not going to be a huge drop in the potassium, but it is going to benefit you somewhat easy. Simple, simple to do. Put your patient on the mask. Let them keep uh, breathing that medicine in while you're trying to get IV access and start your other treatments as well. Okay, all right. Onset, immediate, works pretty much right away and lasts one to two hours. So again, not long-term treatment, but it'll buy you a little bit of time while other things are going on, while you're moving your patients to more definitive treatment of their hyperkalemia. Okay, all right. B, bicarbonate. Great drug, right? Bicarbonate fixes a lot of things, and one of the things it's used for is hyperkalemia. But let's take a look at how this works. Let's look at your cell, okay? So here's your cell. I know my artistry is amazing, isn't it, right? There's a cell, nice round cell. You have hydrogen on the inside, and you have your potassium on the outside. You don't want the potassium out here. So you take your bicarb, and you put it into the extracellular space. You put it into your patient's IV, it gets into the extracellular space. Well, now you've made a relative alkalotic environment out here. And what happens to the hydrogen ions? They go out. They exit. And what happens when the hydrogen ions exit the cell? The potassium enters the cell. So you're shifting potassium intracellularly. Okay? That works pretty well. However, there are some limitations. When you give it, it works well if there's an acidotic environment in the first place. If your patient is not acidotic, Bicarb is not going to help. I see it given a lot for hyperkalemia, just sort of like the cocktail, hit them with everything I can. But bicarb, if your patient is not acidotic, is not going to benefit your patient. So how much you give? 50 to 100 milliequivalents of sodium bicarb. That can be a big sodium load for a renal patient. You can deal with that later, okay? The most important life threat to that patient is malignant dysrhythmia, asystole from hyperkalemia, okay? So one or two of these, one or two amps of sodium bicarb, 50 to 100 milliequivalents given to your patient if the patient is acidotic. All right, insulin and glucose, those two go together. Talk about insulin and glucose. So why do we give insulin? We want the calcemic effect, uh, the kalemic effect of insulin. You want insulin to get potassium intracellularly. Insulin doesn't do anything to eliminate potassium, it moves it, it hides it inside the cell where it is safe and not gonna cause any damage. And where, honestly, it's supposed to be. All right, so insulin shifts the potassium intracellularly and that's the kalemic effect. There's also the glycemic effect. This happens independent of the glycemic effect. So if you have a patient who's very uremic where insulin's not going to work well, or if you have a patient who's a type 2 diabetic and insulin resistance is insulin resistant, the potassium is still going to shift when insulin is given. Insulin has two effects. The kalemic effect, moving the potassium, and the glycemic effect resulting in lowering of glucose. The glycemic effect you kind of have to deal with. The kalemic effect is what you really want. So even if your patient is insulin resistant, give the insulin. It's still going to work to shift the potassium. Okay? All right. The more you give, the greater the effect. That makes sense. Uh, there's a dose response for the insulin and potassium shifting. Onset's 20 to 30 minutes, so it's not immediate, even with regular IV insulin being given, uh, but it does work in relatively short order. Okay, so glucose. Glucose is coming along for the ride here. You need glucose to prevent the hypoglycemia because you can't have the calcemic, the kalemic effect, excuse me, without having the glycemic effect. 
patient is at greatest risk for hypoglycemia in the first three hours after receiving that insulin. That's when you really want to carefully watch the mental status of the patient and do frequent blood sugar checks, okay? All right, so what's our classic recipe? Here's our classic recipe for insulin and glucose in hyperkalemia. Regular insulin, 10 units IV, along with two amps of D50, or 50 grams, two amp, 225 amps of D50. Traditional teaching, not one amp, one amp to increase risk for hypoglycemia, but two amps of D50. And worse it happens is you make your patient transiently hyperglycemic. That's okay. Patients transiently hyperglycemic is not going to do them any harm. And it's not going to do them nearly as much harm as being transiently hypoglycemic, and it's not going to do them nearly as much harm as being hyperkalemic for any duration of time. Okay? So 10 units and 2 amps, generally thought of a 5 to 1 ratio, 50 grams of glucose, uh, 10 units of regular insulin. That's been around for a long time, that 10 and 2. But let's think about that. Maybe one size doesn't fit all for insulin, right? If someone comes in with DKA, we don't give them all the same amount of medicine. We dose it based on their weight. So why not do that for hyperkalemia? Okay? Yes, this is the ever-elusive 70-kilogram uh, male. I don't see a lot of 70-kilogram men in my practice. Some are smaller, some are bigger, some are female. You know, People have all different... Weights, the weight range is quite large. So let's think about giving glucose maybe based on weight in the setting of hyperkalemia. Okay, so this was looked at. Standard dosing, 10 units IV versus weight-based dosing, 0 0.1 units per kilo IV. Again, regular insulin for the treatment of elevated potassium. Okay, what happened? Well, weight-based seemed to perform better. They both, thankfully, diminished the potassium at similar rates. There was no significant, statistically significant change between the potassium lowering of the 10 units uh, given straightforward and the 0 0.1 unit per kilo up to a maximum of 10 units. But what did happen, what did happen, is that there were fewer glycemic effects. Okay, this wasn't a huge study. It's something to keep your eye on, though. There was decrease in hypoglycemia when the weight-based dosing was used. Now, report is that there was up to a 50% reduction in hypoglycemic episodes. And this is not 100% applicable to the emergency department because they followed these patients for longer than patients would typically remain in the emergency department. But it does appear that you're going to cause less hypoglycemia when you use weight-based dosing without reducing the amount of potassium reduction you're going to find in the blood, which is sort of a nice thing to think about. And it makes sense. We really do weight-based dosing for uh, other insulin emergencies. Why not do it for this one? Okay, all right. Now something else on the edge, cutting edge, insulin and glucose. Regular insulin, classic teaching, but now we have short-acting insulins, right? We have uh, Lispro and Aspart, the short-acting insulins, and they're going to give me my same hypokalemic effects, but the hypoglycemic effect, I don't really want that. When I have my patient to definitive treatment for their elevated potassium, I don't want to have to worry about the tail end of that insulin causing my patient's blood sugar to go low. Not really what I want. So maybe if I use something shorter acting, by the time I get my patient to definitive care, I can, it can be over. It can be done, and I won't have to worry about that tail end hypoglycemic effect of the insulin. So thought is, I'm not quite sure ready for prime time yet, still in early investigation, to give a smaller bolus of IV short acting insulin, like six units, and then give a 20 unit per hour infusion of short I think insulin while you're doing your other treatments, while you're mo mobilizing your patient towards definitive care, and then when you're done, you simply shut off your drip and the insulin is gone in very short order and you don't have to worry about prolonged hypoglycemic efforts, uh, events thereafter. Okay, so if you do that though, you do need to make sure you keep up with the glucose while the patient is on the drip, right? So. In order, to, in order to give 20 units per hour to counteract, on average, you're going to need about 60 grams per hour of dextrose. That's more than 2 amps of D50. Okay, So if you use D10, that means about 600 cc's per hour of D10. Now, you can go with more concentrated dextrose solutions, but those are pretty sclerosing and generally need to be given by a central line, especially if you're going to do prolonged infusion, an hour or more than an hour. So that's somewhat rate limiting. However, um, you can also treat your patient with dextrose long-acting, right? The stuff that lasts a lot longer, prevents those hypoglycemic episodes, and that is much more commonly known as, well, lunch, really. It's known as lunch, right? You need to feed your patient. But well, once your patient's, if your patient has good mental status and, and the patient's treatments are underway for their hyperkalemia, uh, there's no reason to think that their mental status is going, going to diminish after that. There's not a reason why you can't actually 
feed that patient while moving them towards definitive care for their elevated potassium. So feed them, right? Something to think about. Uh, again, keep your eye out for it. I imagine we're going to hear more about this. Lower doses, drips, shorter acting insulins, weight base, it's all pretty much evolving. And it's kind of nice to have some new tricks uh, to treat the hyperkalemic patient without the one-size-fits-all insulin and glucose combination. All right. Moving on to K-exalate, right? The old standard. K-exalate, it binds potassium in the gut. It helps to eliminate none of this shifting it around. Forget that. I just don't want to hide my potassium. I want to get rid of it. I want to get it out. K-exalate is supposed to work great in the GI tract. You poop out the um, the potassium. It comes out in the feces. You're done. One problem. It doesn't work. K-exalate doesn't work. Okay, the evidence behind it is that it doesn't work, or it doesn't work to do anything beneficial. Okay, there are possible effects of K-exalate. There are things like <laughs> obstructions, right? Uh, intestinal obstructions and necrosis of the gut and perforations. So it might do something, but nothing's going to benefit your patient. Yeah. So this was looked at, right? So KX is supposed to absorb potassium in an alkaline environment where potassium concentrations are highest. That's known as the colon, right? That's where it's supposed to have its greatest effect. So KX is even give, is either given orally with sorbitol to help increase the motility, shorten the shorten the transit time, or as a retention enema per rectum, right to where it's supposed to work. Well, a group of patients were looked at. One group received sorbitol with nothing, and one group received sorbitol with k -exalate. And then their potassium levels were followed, and their fecal potassium levels were followed to see if this stuff actually worked. And here's what was found out. Serum potassium didn't decrease any more in the group that received k -exalate versus the group that received sorbitol without k -exalate. And fecal potassium levels didn't change either. So the whole basis that k -exalate binds potassium and you excrete it out through the gut was not validated. And here's the interesting part. It's that k exalate was actually approved uh, by the U.S. Food and Drug Association in the 1950s before drugs had to have proven safety and efficacy. So it kind of snuck in under the wire, and here we are 60 years later and still hanging around. So I say leave it alone. Not really going to be of much benefit to your patient and potentially can do harm to your patient. Leave it on the shelf. Okay. All right. Diuretics. Well, if your patient's anuric, if their kidneys don't work, giving diuretics aren't going to benefit you any. But if your patient makes any urine, recruit that kidney. Make it work for you. It's another way of eliminating potassium from the body. Okay? You know, any function, you don't use a potassium-sparing diuretic. That's not what we're looking for. You want a potassium-wasting diuretic. Get a potassium-wasting diuretic uh, in there and get potassium out as you can. Okay? All right. Uh, you know, your classics, furosemide, Bumetanide, terosamide, you can give any of those, you know, sort of the go-to one. We, I think we tend to grab first is furosamide. It's easy access in the emergency department. We give it, get some of that potassium out. Again, anuric patient, not going to do anything. But if your patient's making any urine whatsoever, give it, have them eliminate potassium, one of the adjuncts, one of, one of the multiple modalities you're going to use to treat this life-threatening electrolyte abnormality. Okay. And finally, more definitive treatment, right? You want to get your patient, oh, I'm excuse me, I should also say that with uh, the diuretics, you can give a little saline bolus to, to uh, chase, the, chase the fluid out. Now, oftentimes your patients are hypervolemic, so you want to be gentle, especially if they're the renal patient, you know, 20, 200 cc's, 300 cc's, but you can give a little saline, give the diuretic if, if their kidneys are working at all, get that fluid through, get some potassium out. And then on to definitive treatment, dialysis. That's really what you're moving towards. You're doing all these things to keep your patient alive while the renal teams on their way in or coming down the elevator, whatever it is, wheeling their machine towards you getting the patient hooked up to dialysis. Dialysis eliminates potassium from the body. We're not talking about shifting it around. We're talking about eliminating the elevated potassium from the body. Okay? Dialysis eliminates potassium from plasma. Plasma almost immediately re-equilibrates with extracellular fluid. So essentially, dialysis is removing potassium from the extracellular fluid. But it is a two-step process. The re-equilibration re excuse me, occurs almost instantaneously, but it does actually happen. It's something to think about. Um, this happens even if there's minimal tissue perfusion. So you, if you have a patient who you suspect is a hyperkalemic arrest, or a patient who comes in, evidence of QRS, widening, not looking so great, and then arrests in front of you, while you're continuing your resuscitative efforts and giving all these medicines that we talked about, get your dialysis team down there. Have them hook the patient up. Continue your resuscitative efforts and see if you can get the potassium off and get that heart restarted. 
All is not lost when the patient arrests. Dialysis still plays a role. Now, how fast can you get your patient onto dialysis? That's sort of the tricky part, right? If it is a dialysis patient and they have access, then the limiting factor is really how quickly you can get the machine to the patient's bedside. If they're not a patient already on dialysis and you have to obtain access, that's obviously going to be a harder thing. But definitely think about it. Even with minimal tissue perfusion, as it's happening while CPR is going on, dialysis can work to extract the potassium. Okay. All right. All right. Um, we talked about that re-equilibration, how dialysis removes potassium from plasma. So there is a re-equilibration, and it continues after dialysis is over. So there's this rebound effect for hyperkalemia. So you treat your patient, you, got them on, you gave them all these good medicines, you got them on dialysis, dialysis went, the QRS narrowed down, everything's beautiful, the potassium levels are low. Don't exhale entirely yet, because when dialysis stops, that potassium is going to start to go back up. And potassium can actually go back up for up to four hours after the first round of dialysis is done as that re-equilibration continues. So continue to be vigilant about your patient. Continue to check labs. Make sure those electrolytes are checked often. And oftentimes, patients need round two of emergent dialysis. Now, something that happens four hours later, it doesn't necessarily sound emergent, but it's part of the emergent care of this patient with hyperkalemia. You don't want to feel all relieved. Check the potassium immediately post-dialysis. Everything's good. Put the patient on the floor. Well, they'll get labs checked eight hours later, and then you find that you're back, probably not 100% back where you started, but slid back significantly from all the effort you put in to drive that potassium down and get your patient better. Keep a close eye on that patient for a minimum of four hours after that first round of dialysis, or make sure that the second round of dialysis is simply planned as part of their treatment. Okay, definitive treatment, dialysis. Oh, okay. All right, we're going to cut, talk about a few, a few newer things that are out there. Uh, Pateroma, this is new. This is not emergent treatment. So we've kind of moved beyond emergent treatment. You've gotten your patient to dialysis. We're going to talk about more longer-term management of hyperkalemia. Probably not a medicine you're going to use in the emergency department, but something that may show up on your patient's medication list. Okay, new agent, approved within the past six months in October 2015, new to the market. It's a calcium binding agent. It's essentially trying to be the new KX late. It's trying to be the new KX late that works. That's the difference with this, okay? It's a non-absorbed potassium binder. It gives off calcium, binds potassium, and this is excreted in the feces. Uh, studies so far seem to show this actually does cause potassium to get excreted in the feces. So a better tool than the KX late that we had previously. Um, not huge studies done on this, uh, but they're there, and it was, it's FDA approved. We said it's, it's available for you. You may have your patients come in on it. Most effective for patients with stage 3 or 4 CKD and are also on one of those RAS inhibitor agents like your ACE inhibitors, your ARBs, or um, potassium-wasting uh, diuretics. Okay. Um, Pateroma, keep an eye out for it, probably on your patient list. Now... We also have, oh, as I said, it's a long-term agent, also have ZS9, sodium, zircuronium, cyclosilicylate. Okay, not even properly named yet. That's how new this is. It's not even approved. It's in phase three studies. It's another potential potassium binding agent. Uh, again, supposed to bind uh, potassium to the GI tract and help you uh, excrete it. It's a cation exchanger. Uh, it seems to be effective in shorter order, in about 48 hours. So again, not emergent, uh, but it would work in about 48 hours. Seems to be so far the time that it's given and not huge trials yet. We're still working on it, figuring out if this is going to be approved and available in the United States. Uh, so keep your eye out for it. It may show up on your patient's list. It's going to come out with, I'm sure, a much nicer name than ZS9, uh, but that's what it is. Uh, it's not for emergent treatment, but something to think about uh, for the longer-term treatment for your patient or something to think about when your patient comes in to know that they've had issues with CKD. Or if your patient comes in and they can't talk to you because they're arrested and you find this medication, you'll know that they likely have underlying kidney disease and issues with hyperkalemia in the past. Okay. All right. So moving on here. Let's recap what we talked about. Uh, someone comes in hyperkalemic, hyperkalemia, the most important, most emergent electrolyte abnormality you're going to deal with in the emergency department, truly emergent. Patients skip dialysis, even if they're looking good and feeling good and they just came in to tell you that they haven't had dialysis for six or seven days, worry. Get that potassium level, get that EKG. Potassium and EKG, they've got to go hand in hand, one to the other. Think about the causes of pseudo-hyperkalemia. Again, not lab error. It's not that the lab just ran the test wrong, right, gave you a number that that's not real. 
the lab actually doesn't often make those errors. It's more in the way we draw the blood, have the patient pumping that fist, uh, using a small needle. It can be other effects from other systemic illnesses like um, elevated platelets or elevated white blood cells that can cheer and cause potassium to be released, and then you get a real reading from, from that, and patients that are post-seizure. So things to think about. Is it real? Is it not? While you're figuring that out, get the EKG, correlate your potassium level with your EKG findings, and know how much you have to worry, not at all, to worry quite a lot and have to act quite quickly. Then, of course, you move on to treatment. All right, we talked about see a big K drop, please. So first we're going to start with the emergent treatments, okay? Start with C. C, of course, is for calcium. Calcium does nothing for the potassium, but does help to stabilize the heart, make it less excitable, less likely to degenerate into a malignant dysrhythmia. So calcium, give it if there is a wide QRS. Okay, wide QRS, delayed conduction through the heart, you need to stabilize that cardiac membrane, give the calcium. Two varieties, calcium chloride, calcium gluconate, True emergency, wide, patient's not looking good, you're really worried, give that calcium chloride even if it hurts. You know, apologize later when the patient's still alive to complain to you. That's totally fine. If you have a little bit more time, you can go ahead and give the calcium gluconate less sclerosing, less painful for your patient. Doesn't pack quite as big of a punch, the amount of calcium delivered. You can make that up by giving higher volumes of the calcium gluconate. Okay, so there is calcium. Albuterol, right? Albuterol beta agonist. Albuterol is what I can easily put my hands on. So albuterol, whatever you have, uh, easy, no IV. Simple, simple, simple. 10 to 20 milligrams in the NEB, put it in a mask so the patient doesn't have to worry about holding it on to a NEB treatment while you're working on IV access on their arms. Let them breathe it in. Not going to change your potassium tremendously, but it is going to change your potassium. Again, simulates that sodium potassium pump draws that potassium from the extracellular fluid where it's dangerous to the intracellular fluid where it's not dangerous and where it's supposed to be. Okay, so kind of hiding the potassium back where it's supposed to be, getting it away from the heart, reducing the risk of malignant dysrhythmias. Bicarb. Bicarb is great. It's a great drug for hyperkalemia in the right setting. That setting is acidosis. Patient is acidotic, you give bicarb, helps, again, to shift the potassium intracellularly, does nothing for potassium elimination, but brings it from the extracellular space to the intracellular space. Good, can be redosed. You can usually actually even uh, follow uh, along with the labs and watch, and watch real-time correction of QRS and of uh, potassium levels when you give these medications. You know, okay to redose, but not acidotic, not useful. And you're just giving a sodium load that way to your renal patient. All right. Insulin and glucose, those two go together. Remember, we're really looking for the kalemic effect of the insulin, and the glycemic effect is what we kind of have to deal with. Standard recipe, 10 units of regular insulin IV and 2 amps of D50, old school, classic, maybe not the best one size fits all for everyone. Keep your eyes out. Think about using weight-based dosing. I really like the idea of weight-based dosing for the insulin Follow those chemistries, follow that glucose. Greatest risk of hypoglycemia is in the first three hours. Okay, so you really want to keep an eye on your patient, especially during that time. Think about the shorter acting uh, ones, probably more information coming out on that. Shorter acting insulins on a drip, you turn the drip off. You don't have to worry about the glycemic effect when you've moved your patient onto more definitive treatment and the hyperkalemia is being treated. Okay, all right. Diuretics, if the patient's anuric, they're not going to do anything, uh, right? Give it, you're just, you're just giving a diuretic, it's not going to do anything. But if your patient makes any urine whatsoever, if that kidney is functioning and filtering in any way, give, some, give a diuretic, give some fluid, maybe, as a chaser, with the ch or give the fluid and then chase it with a diuretic, something to get flow across uh, those kidneys and get some potassium excreted from the body. Okay. And, of course, definitive management is dialysis, okay? Dialysis, mobilize your team early on. You know, if you think you have a problem, mobilize your team because it takes a while to get dialysis in and started in general. Um, get them in. You can always turn the dialysis folks away if you don't need it. If this happens in the middle of the night and you've given all these interventions and you've gotten that potassium down and the lab looks better and the QRS looks better and everything looks good, 
still call in your dialysis team. This is not something that can be deferred to morning. I've certainly had that conversation. Oh, give these meds, you know, I'll be in at 8. I've had that. It's not okay because these medicines do not have long duration. You've bought yourself pretty much two hours maximum with Band-Aid techniques to shift potassium around without any true elimination of potassium from the body. Once dialysis is done, you can worry a little bit less, but don't stop worrying altogether. Keep an eye on your patient. Make sure you follow those electrolytes, especially make sure you follow those electrolytes in the first four to six hours after dialysis because you're going to have that post-dialysis rebound effect. That potassium is going to get higher again. How high? Well, I'm not sure, but it's going to get higher from when you just finished dialysis in the next few hours. You need to follow it. You don't want to slide backwards. You have to do all this all over again. And, of course, you don't want to admit that patient to the floor. Have labs not be checked for eight hours and then have your patient back in a critical life-threatening situation. After all your hard work, it's not what you want to have happen. All right. And then we have some of the longer-term agents. Oh, right. Before I went to longer-term agents, you should remind me, I forgot the K-exalate. Well, I didn't forget the K-exalate. The K-exalate's sitting over there in the trash can on the side because it's not really going to be of any benefit to your patient. Okay? Leave it on the shelf, throw it in the trash, clear it out of the pharmacy, not of benefit, potentially of harm. Okay. Now we can really move on to the chronic treatments. Chronic treatments of the patients, there are two new agents for patients with stage 3 and 4 CKD. That is Pedramer. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I think I'm pronouncing that right. It's, new, it's newly approved. It's a calcium, excuse me, it's a potassium binding agent. gives up calcium, binds potassium. The potassium is excreted in the feces. And the ZS9, which I'm sure will come out with a much slicker name than ZS9. Again, if a patient comes in, you know, patients don't always know their medical history. Perhaps they just have a med list with them or they actually have their medicines with them. If you see these two agents, you know you're dealing with someone who has advanced chronic kidney disease, has had issues with hyperkalemia in the past, or a physician is trying to prevent them from having issues with hyperkalemia. If you get that number back and the potassium is high, likely it's going to be real. Okay. That is hyperkalemia. I appreciate your attention. I hope that uh, this is helpful. I know you're going to treat hyperkalemia. I imagine most of you have had very dramatic hyperkalemia cases in the past. I certainly know that I have. It's one of the really rewarding things to treat because you take a patient who's very close to dead, uh, and with the right interventions and moving quickly and paying attention to the details, you can really make that patient a lot better, a lot faster. That's me. I'm Laura Bontempo. That is my email address and my Twitter handle. If you have any questions about the content or anything that I did not cover and you would like to contact me, please do so through either one of those venues, and I will do my very best to get back to you in a timely fashion. Thank you very much.